All right. Do you feel like you worship today? That was great. Such so good, I'm sweating up here. Just singing along, man. When the Holy Spirit falls on a place, it causes you to sweat, I think. So, wow. All right. You can open your Bibles to Judges chapter 11. We're back in the book of Judges. We took a week off last week to talk a little bit about the church and small groups and our vision. We're headed back to Judges. We're a little bit more than halfway through Judges. Some of you will be sad about that. A lot of you might not be too sad about that. But we're, we're getting there. We're halfway through. We're halfway through. And uh, if you're wondering about that song that we sang, the Overflow, and where in the world that those waterfalls are, if you're like me, you're watching, you look at it and you say, man, I'd love to take a tube down at, you know, it's in Croatia, right? Croatia, is that where it is? So we'll have a mission trip to Croatia next year. Uh, bring your wetsuit and your tube. We'll go tubing down the, the overflow r- uh, river there, whatever it is. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. I don't know. All right, Judges chapter 11. We're going to be talking about Jephthah today, but before we do there, let's just do a little recap. We're about halfway through Judges. As I said, we've gone through uh, seven Judges already, if believe it or not. We began with Othnel, the, the judge, and then Ehud and his dagger, and Eglon, the king, where he killed the, the king. We talked about Shamgar, who came from obscurity to, to lead Israel as a judge. We talked about Deborah, the judge, who was a prophetess, and her general, Barak and also Jael, who took that pent peg and, and drove it through the, the head of Sisera, the, the commander of the armies. We talked about Gideon, who went from fear to faith, and then the foolishness. We talked about Abimelech, who was not a judge, but continues that story of, of, of uh, Gideon a little bit farther. We briefly touched on Toel and Jair, which were two other judges that we don't know much about. And and so we've gone this far. There's 12 judges in total. Today we'll talk about our eighth judge, which is Jephthah. But some of the same themes, hopefully if you've been here from week to week, even if you missed a couple weeks, some of the same themes have have popped up almost in every judge or every story we've talked about. I don't list all of them, but maybe some of the ones that you've been thinking of or can remember. Number one, one of the lessons we've seen is that sin gets worse if not dealt with. We've talked about that cycle of sin, right? If we don't deal with sin through repentance, confession and repentance and turning from our sin, turning to to God and dealing with that sin, sin will get worse and worse. It's a downward spiral of sin. We know that in our own life. If we continue to live in disobedience and rebellion to God, we continue to go against his moral authority and what he says we do, that's going to spiral down and down and down. That's the story of Israel and Judges. For some of you, that's the story you're living. You're on that crazy cycle of sin. And God delivers you. You go back into sin. And God delivers you. Suffering comes. That's that's that cycle that we've seen in Judges that we see in our own lives. We've also seen, secondly, that God uses flawed people. God's not looking for perfect people. There are no perfect people. He uses flawed people. Let me say it this way. Significantly flawed people. People that you would not use. People that you would not hire if you were a business owner. That's the kind of people that God uses. We'll see another one today by the name of Jephthah. God uses them. He calls them. He empowers them with his Holy Spirit. And he uses them in mighty ways. God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for available people that are faithful to him. He uses flawed people. Thirdly, we see in all these stories that God is a God of discipline. He's a loving father who disciplines those that he loves. The book of Judges is a chronicle of God, the loving father of Israel, disciplining his people sometimes severely. And he will discipline us because he loves us. Not because he hates us, not to destroy us, but to bring us to a place of repentance and change and transformation. That's why he disciplines us. Fourthly, and most importantly, I hope that you've seen this each week, because I've tried to point this out each week, that the, the, the book of Judges is all about Jesus and our need for Jesus. You get to these stories, you get a little discouraged. Today might be a, a story that may be a little discouraging as we get into it, Jephthah, and some of the, 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 the things he does. But I don't want you leaving discouraged. I want you leaving hopeful in that the book of Judges continually, the heartbeat of Judges, the pointer of Judges continually every week is that you need a deliverer. You need Jesus. Earthly, temporary Judges 
cannot deliver us from our eternal fate of hell and judgment because we're sinners. We need a judge. We need a redeemer that can deliver us ultimately from sin, from death. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. That should be the heartbeat of what you hear every week, that we need Jesus to deliver us. So today, as I said, we'll talk about the eighth judge, deliverer of Israel. His name is Jephthah, and we read about him in Judges chapter 11 and chapter 12. So let's go ahead and read some of the first verses here in chapter 11, if you're open there or have it on your device. Judges chapter 11. Also, you could open our app, and we also on our app have the scripture there as well, if you're more of a a phone guy or phone gal instead of the, the, the Bible. Uh, It is the Bible, but on your phone, instead of, you know, having your your Bible in front of you. So Judges chapter 11, starting in verse 1. This is God's Word. Now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife, the father of Jephthah, also bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they, drew, they, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers, and he lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around him and went out with him. Let's just stop there and pray, and then we'll, we'll dig in a little bit here. But let's ask God to, to bless our time. Heavenly Father, we pray now as we come before your word again, Lord, we pray that you would be pleased to teach us today, to send your Holy Spirit to us, to guide us in your word, to do a work in our lives, Lord. May we glean and learn from judges the lessons that you would have us learn, Lord, that we would be obedient children of yours. Lord, that we would be people of repentance, that we would get out of our sinful cycle, Lord, that we would stop sinning and turn to you and find hope in you in a relationship with Jesus Christ. May that be clear today as we look at the life of Jephthah, Lord. Bless us as we look in your word. Lord, bless those who can't be with us today, Lord. Be with them, heal them, strengthen them, Lord. Be with those that are are suffering from sickness and from cancer. Heal them, bless them. Bless those that are in hospital rooms even today, Lord, uh, struggling for health and for strength. Lord, be with them. Bless them, Lord. Um, Lord, be with them in every way. May they know that we love them and are praying for them. Heavenly Father, be with our nation. Be with our leaders. Be with those that you've placed over us. Bless them as they lead us. May they lead us correctly. May we be good citizens of heaven Uh, and good citizens uh, of this nation, Lord. Be with the men and women who serve us in so many ways, Lord, men and women in uniform that serve here in our community and around this world. Bless them and watch over them as well, Lord. And bless us, Lord, as we come together in your name, in your house, among your children to hear your word, Lord. May you be pleased to bless us today. And we pray this in your name, amen. So Jephthah is a, is a unique character, and you can see right from the beginning, verses 1 to 3 that we just read, is that Jephthah uh, has a rough beginning. So this is an easy street for Jephthah. We see right from the beginning, he lives a life of rejection. He's disowned. I'm going to use some Ds through here, so it can keep you, you know, so we'll try to get everything with a D. That, that's what I spend my week on, with a thesaurus. Thethor, <laughs> thesaurus. Why can't I say that word? Thesaurus, Thesaurus, I still can't say it. We're going to see later on, I'm just like the Ephraimites that can't say Shibboleth, you know, I don't have the SH. Um, so I'm looking for the D's. So he's disowned, he lives a life of rejection, he lives a life of pain and, and loneliness. He's driven out of his family, he begins life with already three strikes against him. He's a son of a prostitute, he's illegitimate, he's worse than illegitimate, his mom's a prostitute. And he's born into this family, and when the, the kids get to a certain age, they say, get out of this family. You're not one of us. You're not legitimate. Every time we look at you, we see a mistake, a mistake our dad made. We see sin. We see shame. You're shameful to even be in our family. Get out of our family, you son of a prostitute. Why are you even here? Why do you even, even think you belong in this family? He's driven away from his family. And he's driven to a place called Tob, and and he gathers around him what the Bible says is worthless men. I like to, my own translation, I think of his band of merry men. You know, maybe maybe they were merry men. I don't know, but but this is the Robin Hood type figure. It's a David. Remember, David was driven out, and he also attracted to himself worthless men. So while he's in Tob with these worthless men, he becomes a mighty warrior. 
He's got to live this way. He's got to fight for everything that that he has. He's got to overcome his past. So he doesn't start off well. This isn't a good beginning. But we see God already working his life and that he's driven him out. But in that time in Tob with these men, he's become a mighty warrior. He has a reputation as a fighter. So what happened? Well, let let me give you some lessons before we move on. Lesson number one. Looking at Jephthah and how he starts. N- number one, our past does not define us. Some of you need to hear this today. Your past does not determine who you are. Where you come from, the mistakes that you might have made, the mistakes that might have been made against you, they do not determine who you are. You are not responsible for the sins that were done against you. You are not responsible for who you were born to. You're not responsible and you're not judged according to those things. Do not find your identity in the past. So many people today, Christians included, live in the past and find their identity in the past. What either they did or what was done to them defines them for the rest of their lives. And you know people like this, hopefully you're not one of these people, but they can never break out of that. They live their entire lives dominated and defined by their past. And it's a sad existence. And you know people like this. I pray you're not one of these people because Jesus Christ breaks the chain of your past. Your identity is found in Christ, not in your past. And and, and if you were born in Jephthah's condition and your mom was of ill repute and a prostitute and your family rejected you, some of you might be able to actually relate to some of this. For a lot of people, just those two first things would be enough to destroy them, would be enough to determine to them for the rest of their lives, who they're going to be. That's the sad thing. That's the thing that a lot of this, just, just being born this way, being rejected by his family, some people never are able to overcome that. It's sad. It's a sad existence. People who cannot over, overcome what's happened to them in the past. Jephthah couldn't control his birth. Jephthah couldn't control the, 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 his family members that kicked him out. He was sinned against. He was rejected. But he is not, the, not judged or identified by their actions towards him. Don't fall into that trap of being defined by your past. That's a lie of the devil. The second thing we can learn from Jephthah's beginning is that God uses rejects. I love this about God. He loves to use rejects. Those that are disowned, those that are rejected, those that are marginalized, those that are seen as useless in this world, God uses them. He uses Jephthah's. He uses Gideons. He uses Samsons. He uses people that that are far from perfect, flawed significantly, and rejected. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He calls them. He sets them apart. He empowers them, and he uses them for his glory. That's how God operates. No one is too far gone, too stained, too messed up, too flawed too hurt, too broken for God not to use in a significant way. See, the second one goes right on the first one. If your past defines you, you will continually go through life with a dark cloud over your head, with your head down, and you will never think God can ever use you for anything good. That's a lie. And a lot of people believe that lie. Those are the kind of people that God uses mightily. And then thirdly, we can look at this and say that Jesus Christ himself was a reject. Jesus Christ himself was a reject. He was rejected by men. Jephthah was rejected by his family. Sort of a Christ figure pointing to Jesus. Isaiah tells us that he was despised and rejected by man. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief as one whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Doesn't seem like Jesus had a high earthly position, does it? He was rejected. He was hated. People would look at him and turn away from him. He was hated that greatly. He was rejected. John 1, verse 11, he came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. God uses rejects, and Jesus Christ can identify with Jesus. He was a reject, rejected by his people, rejected by his family. Let's Let's just say this. We could say, rejected by men, but approved unto God is a good start. Rejected by men, but approved unto God, that's a good start. That's where Jephthah started. So, he is disowned. And soon, the desperate come calling. The desperate's our next D. The desperate, those that rejected him, now are going to ask him for help. 
Get this, verse 4. After a time, the Ammonites, an enemy of Israel, the Ammonites made war against Israel. When the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead, Jephthah's people, went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house, the whole community? You hated me? Have you now come to me in your distress? Verse 8, and the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned to you now that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head, our leader over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, that's important, the Lord works through me and gives them to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be our witnesses between us if we do not do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all these words, all his words, before the Lord of Mitzvah. So those that rejected him now need him. Those that have kicked him out now see a need for him. In fact, not just a need for him, but a leader. You know how to fight. You need to fight for us. Why would I fight for you? You hated me. You rejected me. You kicked me out. The whole community turned against me, and now you have the audacity to come and ask me for help. What would you say? I know what you'd say. You'd say the same thing I'd say. I'd say, tough luck. Tough luck. You got yourself in this mess, get yourself out. I'm happy and told with my band of merry men here. Go fight yourself. You should have thought of that before you rejected me. But that's not what he says. But we get right here in the beginning that Jephthah's a good man. He's a good man. He's so good, he is willing to fight and perhaps die for those that hate him. They rejected him, they hated him, he's not bitter. He negotiates with them to see a little bit, are you really telling the truth, I will be your leader. But there's no hate, there's no animosity, there's no bitterness there, that's amazing. And not only is he a good man, we can surmise from this already that he's a godly man. To some extent, he's a godly man. How do I know that? Because he often acknowledges God. If God gives them over to me, he spoke all his words before the Lord at Mitzpah. God has a place in this man's life. We don't know his, you're going to see in a minute, we're going to question his spirit, spirituality here, but we can see right from the beginning, this, this is a man that has a place for God. He acknowledges God throughout his story. Verse 21, verse 23, verse 27, verses 30 and 31, chapter 12, verse 30, he acknowledges God. He's a good man, he's a godly man to some extent. And he agrees to to, to fight for these people. Well, well, looking at Jephthah as our Christ figure, a man who's rejected, well, we can, we can look a little bit deeper at this, that, that here's a, almost a picture of salvation. He was rejected is now our Savior. Jesus Christ was rejected and now becomes our Savior. He who was despised and esteemed not, he's the one who died for us. Him who we wrote off, him that we wanted nothing to do with, him that we rejected, is our Savior that saves us. He came and he saved his enemies. We were all, if you're a believer today, I, I hope that you are, at one time in your life, you were not a believer, you were an enemy of God. That's what the Bible calls you. And you weren't a child of God, you weren't a friend of God, you were an enemy of God. And Jesus Christ came to save his enemies, us. And to take his enemies and to transform them into his friends, into his children. That's the process. So he comes to his enemies. Those that we rejected is now the one who will save us. But to, to get him to, 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 to realize that salvation, we have to come as absolutely destitute and desperate, don't we? Right? You know? When we come to the cross, we come with nothing in our hands. We become empty. Nothing do we bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. We come empty-handed. You don't come and negotiate with God. You don't come and say, I'm going to bring something to the table. You bring something to the table. I can meet you 50. I can meet you halfway, Jesus. I can meet you here. Let, let's negotiate. There's no negotiate. You come absolutely destitute and desperate to Jesus Christ or you don't come at all. That's it. It's only, the only people he accepts are those who are absolutely desperate and dependent and destitute. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That's what I was looking for. Now that we sing that. 
They come like the, the Gileadites came to Jephthah and says, we've got nothing. Can you lead us? We have nothing to offer you. And, and when you come, you must believe and you must make him your head, right? That's what they do with Jephthah. We're in desperation. We need you. You need to save us, deliver us as our judge. We believe in you. We'll make you our head. This is a, a mini picture of salvation. This is what happens in salvation. We come to him who rejected to save us. We come in desperation and we come to make him our savior and our head. Right? Right. There, that's your part. Right? Right. Right, right. So we come desperately to him who was rejected to be our savior. Disowned, rejected, and now their deliverer, just like Jesus Christ. Well, Jephthah takes this position on, and we expect... Jephthah and his mighty, worthless warriors of Tob to march in like a bunch of hotheads, right? Because they're living in Tob and they're worthless, right? They probably can't think straight. They're just going to go right in there and they're going to wipe them out. No, no, actually we're surprised at the wisdom of Jephthah. He's a very wise man. He's a good man. He's a godly man. He's a wise man in that he begins this in, in, as a diplomat. He goes to his enemies, the Ammonites, and he talks to them like a wise person would do. This is our next D, diplomat. He goes to, to find out what's going on and to negotiate peace, perhaps. This is unique in, in a lot of the judges, that, that before he fights, he tries to, 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 to seek peace. Now, he goes and finds out what's going on here. Verse, we're going to pick this up in verse 12, chapter 11, verse 12. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites, and he said, what do you have against me that you have come to me to fight against my land? Why, why are you fighting us? And the king of the Ammonites answered the messenger of Jephthah, because Israel, on coming up from Egypt, roughly 300 years ago, took away my land, from the Aaron to the Jabbok to the Jordan, and now therefore restore it peacefully. When you came out of Egypt, you took our land, from, from the Jabbok to the Jordan. This, this, this plot of land you're living on was ours. You took it. So we have an offense against you. This is our claim. You stole our land, and now we're going to fight for it back. So that's the, that's the claim of the Ammonites. That's what they're saying, that Israel stole their land. Well, Jephthah, and, and here again, Jephthah is a surprise to us. A rejected man living in Tob with other worthless people, you don't really have much hope in. But there's great hope in Jephthah. He's a wise man. He knows his Bible. He knows the history of Israel. He says, you're wrong. He says, you're wrong. I'm going to give you three reasons, and he's going to argue, or he's going to send messages back to the king of Ammonites saying that you're wrong. Your claim is wrong. Number one, it's wrong because of history. Verses 14 to 22, you can read that on your own. He says, that's not the case. This is not what happened. We did not take your land. We went to the kings, the kings of Moab. The kings did not let us go through their land. We went around their land. This was not your land. It was never your land. We did not take your land. Jephthah knows history. He knows his Bible. How would he know the history of what happened when they came out of Egypt? He would know that because he'd have the Torah written by Moses, and he knows the Torah. He knows the history of Israel, whether that was passed on orally, or he read it from Moses' writing. He knows this. You're wrong because of history. You're wrong also because of theology. He makes a theological argument. He says, you, you got your theology all messed up. This is, we'll pick this up, uh, chapter 11, verse 23. The first argument is history. You have your history wrong. You have your theology wrong. Verse 23 of chapter 11. So then the Lord, this is Jephthah speaking. So then the Lord, the God of Israel, disposed the Amorites, not the Ammonites, the Amorites, be, from before his people Israel. And are you to take possession of them? Will you not, verse 24, take, will you not possess what Chemosh, their, their false god, your god, gives to you to possess? And all that the Lord your God has dis disposed before us, we will possess. Now, you are, are, now, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he, er, did he ever contend against Israel, or did he ever go to war with them? Okay, so what he's saying here is, back then, if you won a victory, they were all very religious back then, right? You said, our God has brought victory to us, and you would, you would go in and, and, and take the spoils of that victory, giving your God the credit, right? And he's just making a theological argument. If your false god, Chemosh, gave you victory over land, that gives you the right to that land. Your God gave you that land, right? We're working on the same principle you're working on. Our God, the true God, Yahweh, has given us this land. This is now our land. It was given to us by God. Just like you, when you defeat someone, you claim your God has given you that land. So he's saying, this is, this is how it works. Whose God is better? This is, the entire Old Testament, or a lot of the Old Testament is written in polemic argumentative language. We don't realize it now because we're, we're so many thousands of years removed. But it's written in argumentative language because it's written to people of their time as well as to us. 
And it's always making arguments against false gods. We don't always pick up on them because those are no longer our false gods. But here's a power struggle. Here's a power encounter. Your God, your false God, whether it be Baal or Ashereth or Chemish, whatever it might be, he gives you victories. Our God, Yahweh, gives us victories. Let's see who the true God is. It's a theological argument. You're wrong because our God has given us these lands. Just like as if you had beaten, beaten, you would have it under the authority of your God. So not only that, and then the last argument he makes is law. The law argument. I guess it would be squatter's law. I don't know what law it is. Verse 26, when Israel lived in Heshbon and his villages and Aor and the villages and all the cities that are on the banks of the Arnon, 300 years, why did you not deliver them within that time? We've lived here for 300 years and now you come knocking, this is yours? Where were you 300 years ago? We've been here a long time. Legally, this is our land. 300 years. So he says, you're wrong. So we we see a diplomatic Jephthah that is wise, that is good, that is godly. Israel's not wrong. The Ammonites are wrong. Verse 27, therefore, therefore I have not sinned against you. You do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, that's Yahweh, our God, the true God, the judge, will decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. Let's leave it with our gods. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. You're, you're the ones who are trespassing. You are the ones who are waging war wrongly and have sinned against us. I, I, you know, there's a lot to learn here. Again, Jephthah is this interesting, interesting character. A, a disowned guy, a, a, a rough guy living in Tob with worthless men, but, 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 but good, godly, wise now, he's interacting with the world. He's interacting with, a, with a, a, a false claim against him, and he's interacting uh, w- with this person as, uh, we, I use the word diplomat, going back and forth. What can we learn from that? Well, there's a lot of things we can learn. We're, living, we're, we're in a similar cir- circumstance. We want to be like Jephthah. We want to be wise when we interact with the world. Number one, we need to know what Jephthah knew. We need to know history. That sounds sort of stupid, but it's not. You need to know history. Biblical history is certainly primary, but history in general. It's interesting that one of the ways that the, the world is seeking to destroy truth and just seeking to destroy Christian truth specifically and morality is by destroying history. You see this. Statues are being torn down and things are being rewritten. People are no longer being taught uh, American history or different types of history because they're seeing history as, as evil, as wrong. We're, we're looking back through a lens of social justice saying, look at all this wrong that's in our past. Let's rewrite it. Let's forget about our past. That, that's what's happening. This, and, and, and we're trying to fit it into our modern time, our modern thinking, and, and we're, we're absolutely destroying history. Just this week, Harvard. Harvard has a, has a, a hall of, it's Harvard, okay, Harvard. All the, the people of Harvard that won Nobel Prizes, they have like a, they have uh, paintings of them, right? I mean, Nobel Prize winners, that's something a, a school would want to show. Hey, we've got, 20 Nobel Prize winners. Wow, wow. They removed them all. They had to go down because they're, they're, they're too white. Too many white men were there. So we got to remove. That's history. That, that's not a racial statement. That's not a, any kind of statement other than we are, these are the people that have come out of these same places you are and have done great scientific things. It's, it's, a, it's a wall of remembrance. But take that down because it doesn't fit our social categories anymore. Now you sort of say, what's the big deal? It's a big deal because this is widespread now. We're trying to rewrite history according to, to different means. And this isn't just happening in America. This is happening in the church. The, the big evangelical leaders, right, have, you know, here, um, I get myself in trouble sometimes here. Let me just follow this thought up, but say it in a better way. Um, Sinful men, sinful people, uh, people that their their thinking is is warped by sin would say to you that we're evil. America's evil, right? That's why they're trying to change history, because we're evil. We were founded on, on, on evil things like slavery. That's why our founding, the New York Times says, is 1618, not 1776. They have all these things. They're trying to rewrite history because America's evil. That's part of their thinking, that, that our history is wrong and evil. The church has come along and sort of co-opted that, and a lot of what you'll hear from big evangelical people is that the church is evil. They'll say this a lot. The church has done wrong. We've, we've been bad to people. We've marginalized. We've hated people. We've, we've judged people. That the church of Jesus Christ, we've done so many bad things that we need to be in a posture 
of repentance. We need to be in a posture of, of, of subjection to the world because we've been so bad to the world. They've co-opted this whole movement and applied it to the church. That we ought to be ashamed of what the church of Jesus Christ has done. Are there things the church has done that are wrong? Absolutely. <laughs> We're far from perfect. But to, to bring this, this shame and different things into the church of Jesus Christ, again, this is rewriting history. We need to know our history. I made that point. Pretty, uh, we need to know our history. Soon the only place, the only place you, that you will, you will uh, know history is probably the church, the church if, if we hold on to truth. If we don't, then, then, then there'll be no place to, to find history. Okay, secondly, we need to know our theology. We need to know our theology. I hit this one a lot. You need to know the truth of God's word about who God is, about who we are. Jephthah knew that. We need to know that. That's why it's important that we study God's word every day. It's important that we come to, we talked about this all last week, small groups and, and personal devotions and coming to church and getting involved is essential to your growth. If you want to hold on to truth, if you think truth is important, certainly in the biblical context, in your Christian faith, but also in the broader context, if you think truth at all is important, you need to be in a Bible preaching church, period, and be there as often as you can possibly be there. It's for your good. It's essential. Get into a small group. Get a study Bible. I got more study Bibles out there. Get a study Bible. Get into God's Word. Get into truth. You need it. Know your theology. And then thirdly, be diplomatic. Be like Jephthah. Talk to people. Discuss things. The Bible says we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be loving, be gentle, but stand firm on the truth and be strong when you take a stand for truth. This week, a uh, football player came out uh, with a, a, a new initiative uh, for the church. It's called Bring Your Bible to School. Great, great idea. I think it's a great idea. Focus on the Family is the one behind this. You might have heard of Focus on the Family. James Dobbs used to be a part of it. He's now moved on. But they have this a new initiative, Bring Your Bible to School. It's on a certain date. And this football player is very famous and is a believer. Said, hey, let's do this. Let's, let's encourage our kids to bring their Bible to school. Well, what happens when you make a public statement like that and you're in the public eye? You get hammered, and he got hammered. Oh, did he get hammered. Every LGBT, every progressive, every, the, how dare you promote a book that is as hateful as the Bible? How dare you do that? How dare you promote a ministry like Focus on a Family that, that, that just pro, pro, produces hate against, against people different than them? And they hammered him. He took a stand, a pretty relatively benign stand, pick up, your, you know, bring your Bible, and he, and he, and, and he took a stand there, and, and when it came down on him, what did he do? He folded like a cheap suit, right? He, he apologized, I, you know, he, because if, if you this is the world we live in. If you're going to take a stand for truth, you're going to get hit hard. You're going to get hammered. None of us like to get hammered. None of us like to be called names. None of us want to be called a bigot. None of us want to be called hateful. None of us want to be called racist. None of us want to be called any of these names. And that's why the world uses these names constantly. Constantly. If they don't like you or you say something they don't like, you will get those names thrown at you. It doesn't matter. And they don't have to have any, any semblance of relevancy or anything. But those are the names you'll hear against you from your coworkers, from your boss, from your organization, from the world around you. So if you're going to take a stand, you've got to be ready. Be diplomatic. Talk. But be realized when you do take a stand, you're going to get hit hard. And, and unfortunately, most public Christians, whether they be musicians or leaders or uh, football players, whatever they are, when, when they do mistakenly, I think, take a stand, they get hit and they back right away from it. It's hard. It's hard to take a stand. Take your Bible to school. Well, never mind. Let's go on to the next one. Be diplomatic. Fourthly, defender. Be a defender of the truth. Jephthah is a defender. He's going to defend his people against the Ammonites. Right? Look at verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord. This is common in the book of Judges. When God calls a judge, when he empowers them, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them. The Holy Spirit came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and he passed on to Mitzpah of Gilead, and from Mitzpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. He goes to war against the Ammonites. Pick it up in verse 32. Skip ahead a little bit. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. Very common. The Lord gave them. This is God's victory. God did this. Gave them into his hand, and he struck them from the Aror uh, to the neighborhood of Minneth 
20 cities, and as far as Abel, uh, Karaman, with great blows. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. A great victory was won. We don't have a lot of details on it. The battle's not important. That's sort of a, a sub thing here going on. The battle itself, the important thing is that God gave Jephthah the victory. God empowered him with the Holy Spirit. God used him to his glory. And Jephthah defends and defeats the Ammonites. Again, to go back to one of our main themes that we talked about, God uses flawed people, and when he uses flawed people, he empowers them, he calls them, he empowers them, and he uses them. Just like he does other judges. Flawed people, God uses in great ways. Secondly, we see this language throughout judges. God gives. A lot of times you see it reversed. You say, God gave Israel into the hand of the Moabites. God gave Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So, so and now we see the opposite, that when the people of God are obedient, God gives his, their enemies to him. The key word is that God is the giver in all this. What do I mean by this? It means that God is sovereign over the nations, all nations. This is important. This is important. God raises up leaders, he brings down leaders. God raises up governments, he brings down governments. God appoints people, and he, and he disappoints people. The, the heart of the king, the heart of the president, the heart of the prime minister, the heart of the pharaoh, whoever your leader is, is in the hands of God, and he directs it like a stream of water. God is sovereign over the nations. This is very important. God is in control. God's in control. Now, you might, if you immediately have objections to that, and a lot of people do, well, what about free will? What about choices you make? And, and those are good questions. But if you read your Old Testament, in fact, if you read the whole Bible, you will find that the authors of the Bible are not at all concerned with defending your free will. Not, not, none of the authors of the Bible give any, any ink to defending man's free will. What they spend their time on is defending the sovereignty of God. That's what you see here. You might say, well, wait a minute, how can God? I don't know, I don't know. But here's what I do know. God is the God over all the nations, over all people. And in our day and age, this is something we need to remember, and we see throughout the Bible, God is sovereign. He's in control of the nations. And then thirdly, he defends his people, and I love this about Jephthah, he gives God the glory. This worthless man with worthless tobe men hanging out with him gives God the glory. Even, even in chapter 12, verse 3, he's talking to the Ephraimites. He says, the Lord gave them into my hands. He realizes it. He claims no victory for himself. God did this. I was an instrument of God. Again, we're seeing a man who's in tune to some degree with God. He gives God the glory. He knows that God did this, that God raised him up, God empowered him, and God gave the Ammonites to him. He realizes this, and he gives God the glory. So far, so good. Just like Gideon. Man. And this is following the arc, the, the story arc of almost all the judges. God uses them, and then all of a sudden, we don't hear about God anymore, and something bad happens. They make a stupid decision. Well, the next D is dummy. <laughs> I apologize. I've had a couple parents complain to me. Not complain, but point out, I've been using the S word a lot. The synonym with dummy. I'm not going to say it because there are little kids in the group here, and that's a word they're not supposed to say at home. S-T-U-P-I-D. I'll spell it. I can't spell it yet. Don't say that because I'm teaching my kid not to say that word. And then when you say it, it just really, so I'll, you, I, hopefully this is a word you can use in your home. Maybe not. You, is this okay? Is this, no, it's not a good word. See, there it is. I, I didn't win even with this one. <laughs> that's why they, they get their kids out of here early. Get them out. The pastor might say something. Say something that we want our kids to hear. That's a terrible thing. But he is. He's foolish. If I, if I was, you know, I, I'm stuck with the D's. That's why I got stuck with dummy. But he's foolish. The foolish vow. So foolish. The, 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 the foolishness of this vow is incalculable. How could he be this foolish? Verse 30. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, a promise, a covenantal promise. This is very important. A vow to the Lord. If you will give me the Ammonites into my hands, then whatever comes out from the door of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. This is beyond dumb. Why would you do this? Why would you... And... and out of all the passages and judges, this is the most that the scholars are puzzled about and most ink is spilt, like trying to figure out what in the world was Jephthah thinking. 
Jephthah's been doing so good. Why make this vow? There's no reason to make this vow. He's not like Gideon. Remember Gideon had a doubt. Remember the fleece and the, he, Gideon was scared and he had to, God had to reassure him. So he was always asking God, do this, do this, do this. And God's reassuring Gideon because he's patient with Gideon. But we don't see any of that doubt with Jephthah. It's not like he needed this to, to, uh, to assure him to make this bargain with God. We have no idea why he chooses to do this. And it's so foolish. And there's two ways to understand this vow. The first one is that he's talking about an animal. Right? The Bible's, the Torah's been written. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay? The first five books of the Bible written by Moses. He has access to them or they're somewhere in his realm. Okay? So he knows what a burnt offering is. He knows how to bring an offering to God. This is all in his understanding in some way. That's why he says this. I will give whatever comes out of my house. What? 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 So if and many commentators want to say he's talking about an animal. And it was sometimes common, you'd have animals in your house, especially in winter months, to keep them warm, and it might be common for animals to be in your house. But this is still, a, still foolish, because what kind of animal are we talking about? What if a dog came out of this house? They had dogs back then. And who else would come out to greet you? Animals don't greet you. Your rabbit, your ferret, your sheep, your goat isn't happy to see you unless you're feeding it. Only a dog would be happy. Oh, look, master's back and would run out. To, so is he, would, he, would he sacrifice a dog to God? That God says, no, 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 you don't do that. That's an unclean animal. No way, that, that has no place, right? So why would you make a vow? Anything, whatever, whatever comes out of my house. So even if you say animal, it's a foolish vow, but if you, if you look in your footnotes, if you have an ESV Bible, which many of you do, what does it say? If you look at where it says, whatever, it has a little number by it, doesn't it? Number one in my Bible, you look down in the Bible, it says what? Or whoever. The Hebrew here can go either way. He could be saying, whoever comes out of my house, I will kill and burn on an altar to God. Could be, he could be talking about a person. It's very, in fact, most, in fact, all ancient scholars believe he's talking about human sacrifice and most modern scholars believe he's talking about human sacrifice. Whoever comes out of my house first, I will kill and burn to the glory of God. Can you imagine? Now, this, 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 <laughs> This, this, this is, either vow is troubling. And either way you take it, it's very troubling. And either way you take it really shows how Israel has mingled with the pagan religions around them. Many of the pagan, pagan religions around them, the Ammonites, the Amorites, the Moabites, the Philistines, all these other people dwelling around them often did human sacrifice. It was a common thing for, you know, their religion to do human sacrifices. So this shows that the, the pervasive influence, although Jephthah knows his Bible, he knows the Torah, he's trying to be a godly man, it just shows the influence of the world around him that in some way, in some messed up sinful way of thinking, he thinks that God, the God of Israel, Yahweh, the covenantal God, would be, would be okay and happy with him offering a human sacrifice or, or any kind of sacrifice. So we see right here the mixing of pagan religion, the world in with God right here. And it just shows, one of the things it shows, that if he is talking about a person, and I'm not convinced he is, but if he's talking about a person, it shows how far we can get from God. And the farther we get from God, listen, the farther we move from God, the less and less human life is valuable. The farther we move from an understanding of the biblical God who made us in his image, who loves us and died for us on the cross, we reject that truth. The farther we get from that truth, one of the things that will happen is we will devalue human life more and more and more and more. That's what we're seeing in our culture. That's what we're seeing in our culture. Suicide rates are astronomical right now, especially in young men. Young men are killing themselves at an unprecedented rate in our nation right now. You probably don't even know that. Abortion, euthanasia, all these things that we have devalued human life. And these questions come to us at the most horrible times in our lives. We have to make decisions about this. And if we don't have a rock solid understanding of God's word and a willingness to take a stand for truth, we will fold like a cheap suit. 
It's easy to make these decisions about life on Sunday mornings in a pulpit and in a, in a pew. It's a lot harder when it's your life and you have to make these decisions. But this is what we see in a world that has rejected Jesus Christ and rejected his word and rejected this truth. One of the signs is that we will f- get further and further away from valuing life. Go back to the Roman world that Christianity was birthed into. How did they value human life? They had zero value for human life. You know, the Greeks and the Romans would take their children out to the, out to the boneyard, right? And they would look at that child. And if that child had any kind of defect, they would throw it down into the pile of bones. Or if it was a, a, a female and they didn't want a female, they would throw that child. And they've excavated these pits of baby bones, thousands and thousands, where they were discarded. They were unwanted. Because they had no value for life. Because that's how far they were from God. We're going right back to that. You know what the Christians used to do? The Christians, this is, how the, this is how Christianity changed the world. This is how Jesus Christ changed the world. They would discard their babies and then a Christian would come and take that baby. We'll raise this baby. The defective baby, we'll take the defects. We'll take, the, we'll take these babies. We'll raise these babies because to us, because we know Jesus Christ, because we know God's truth, we value life made in God's image. So we'll take those children. We'll raise those children. That's a radical community. And when a community like that uh, begins to operate like that, that will change the world. That will, abs- it has before, and it will again if we begin to live that way again. But here we see that, that Jephthah in some way believes that this would be acceptable to God, and he makes this foolish vow. And if you don't know the story, you know, what could happen? What bad could come of this vow? Well, we know, if you know the story, and this is the sad part of it, verse 34, Jephthah came home to his house after this great victory, and behold, his daughter, his only daughter, his only offspring came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances full of joy at the victory that God has granted her father as the leader of Gilead. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter, and as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, that's, that's a sign of great agony, great mourning. He tore his clothes. Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, my father, an amazing woman, an amazing young lady, my father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, the Ammonites, So she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months that I may go up and down the mountains and weep for my virginity and and me and my companions. So he said, go. And then he sent her away two months and she departed, she and her companions, and they wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of the two months, she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. Did Jephthah kill and sacrifice his daughter? (laughs) What a topic for a Sunday morning. (laughs) This is in the text. We've got to deal with it. I am not sure. The Bible does not clearly and definitively say that he sacrificed her as a burnt offering. He fulfilled his vow, right? And remember his vow that, that whatever comes out the door of my home to meet me when I return from the Amorites shall be the Lord's. It's part of his vow, and I will offer it up. Well, we know that he fulfilled his vow in some way, but was the vow fulfilled with lifelong virginity and service to God in the temple because many women were brought to the temple and served God that way? Or did he actually carry out this, this terrible deed of killing his daughter? So a couple points. I don't want to belabor this because uh, there's not a lot to edify us in this, but let's just tackle it a little bit. Number one, The Bible condemns human sacrifice clearly, strongly, forcefully, okay? Jephthah knows his Bible to a degree. He would know that. Uh, But again, Israel has so been corrupted by the pagan worlds around him, there's a possibility that he thinks in some sick way this may be acceptable to God. Secondly, the Bible in Leviticus chapter 5 and chapter 27, the book of the law, Leviticus, gives ways out of foolish vows, Specific, if you made a foolish vow, Leviticus 5, here's how you get out of it. 
before God. Leviticus 27, here's a way that if you've been rash and foolish with your words and made a vow to God that you don't want to do now, here's how you get out of it. So there is a loophole, there's a way out of this vow. That if Jephthah didn't know this, he could have easily gone to a priest of that day and said, oh, I don't want to kill my daughter. And the priest would say, here's what you need to do. Thirdly, his daughter laments her virginity, not her life. That seems a bit odd. It seems a bit odd that she's more concerned that she'll never be with a man or have a family, which is, was a huge stigma of the day, rather than she was going to die. I'm, I'm mourning my life and what will never be. She's mourning his virginity, which seems to say what she's mourning is she will never have a family, she'll never have children, she'll always be a, an outcast because there was a big stigma on women that weren't married or did not have children. Fourthly, Jephthah at this point is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Chapter 11, verse 29. Now, it is possible to sin with the Holy Spirit in you, but could you do this? Could you murder your, you know, could you do this with the Holy Spirit indwelling you at that moment uh, as well? Hebrews eleven thirty two, fifth fifth point, list Jephthah as a hero of the faith. Now, Samson's a hero of the faith. Gideon, they all had significant flaws, but this goes beyond, you know, significant flaw, I think. This goes into human sacrifice. I, I don't think he would be included in the list of people we are to emulate for their faith in the, if he actually committed murder. Women often served in the temple for their lives were dedicated to temple service. Um, so there's many ways to look at this. Um, the plainest reading of the text is he sacrificed his daughter. If you have ESV study Bible, which many of you do, and you read the notes, the ESV study Bible, the writers of that belief, he sacrificed his daughters, which is the more common interpretation of this in, in, the, in, in scholarly circles. Um, I, I, I don't want to think that. I want to think that he dedicated her to lifelong virginity. That's why she mourns her virginity. Um, and I'll stick with that. And we'll find out in heaven. Uh, you know, I'm sure that we won't even care about that in heaven. But there's a few lessons we can even learn from this, this terrible deed. The first one is obvious. Be careful with your words. Be careful with your words. <laughs> Do not be rash with words. Do not speak in foolishness. Control your tongue. Right? James has a whole, you know, the, the tongue is a fire, and it's set on fire from where? Hell. Hell sets your fire on tongue, and it can do so much damage. Be careful. Secondly, don't try to manipulate God. Whatever he's doing with this vow, he's, try, he's trying to do something. God, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. Don't, don't ever use that formula. God, if you do this, I will do this. That is an unbiblical formula, right? You ask God, God, do this for me, but you don't bargain with God. You don't try to manipulate him. You don't have, a, have some kind of contract with God. God, if you get me through this, I will serve you the rest of my life. If you get me through this, I'll go to church every Sunday. Stop with that nonsense. A lot of people live with that. that. That's Jephthah. If you give me victory, I will give you whatever comes out of my house. It's a, it's a bad formula. And thirdly, don't act like the world. Don't let the world's thinking infiltrate your faith. Fight against that. If that's what it was, if, and it's certainly to some degree it was, that the pagan religions had somehow infiltrated Jephthah's understanding of God, fight against that. Don't be influenced by the world around you. Only be influenced by the scriptures, by God's word. Be careful what you say. Don't try to make like that. Don't act like the world. Well, Jephthah, where does the story end? Well, Jephthah ends again after, after his great victory over the Ammonites, Chapter 12, verse 1 to 7, the Ephraimites. Remember the Ephraimites? These were the guys who criticized Gideon. You didn't invite us to fight. And they're mad at him, right? And same thing happens to, this must be their, their modus operandi. This is what they do. After everything is won, they come along and say, hey, you didn't include us on this. Chapter 12, verse 1. The men of Ephraim were called to arms. They crossed the Zaphon and they said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over and fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. Now, this happened to Gideon because he didn't include the Ephraimites in the battle, although they both called him and neither of them came. And, and Gideon used flattery. Remember? Oh, you're so great. Your, your, your harvest is so much greater than ours. You're a greater people. He, he diffused it with flattery. Uh, uh, Japheth does a, he, he does a, he has a different tactic. Oh, oh yeah, he says, okay. While he has his army there, the, the Gileadite army, they, they wipe out the Ephraimite army. Okay? They go to battle. Again, this is the, the, the how bad sin has become. The Israelites are fighting against Israelites. And then the, the battle's over. 
Gideon, uh, Jephthah and his forces have won the battle. Now peop, the, the Ephraimites are trying to go home. And they have to cross over a river to get home. And there's a bunch of, a bunch of refugees retreating from the battle that they've lost roundedly. And Jephthah, in his, in his anger, will not give, get, let them off that easy. Uh, chapter 12, verse 5. And the Gileadites, that's Jephthah's group, captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. So they have the river, the Jordan River, that they have to cross over. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, are you an Ephraimite? And he said, no, because, you know, they're battle. And they said to him, well, then say Shibboleth. <laughs> it's like, you know, are you from Jersey? Yeah, say water. Say water. Water. Say water. Water. Right? Are you from New England? My, my mom's from New England. Say Park the car. Park the car. You know, these, these, these are regional dialects, right? You've got a couple here in Pennsylvania, but I want I to think to, to make fun of them. <laughs> we all have these. So, Shibboleth, they couldn't say the SH. Apparently, they'd say Sibboleth, right? And they'd say, oh, Sibboleth. And then they would kill the person. 42,000 retreating Ephraimites got killed. Never mind the ones who died in battle. 42,000 died just because they could not say Shibboleth. Imagine if you had a lisp, you know, my goodness, this is quite a test. This is the, this is the, the, again, the arc that we see. This is where we go from faith and victory to foolishness. You know, we see Jephthah's anger, his, his foolishness take over, and again, we're seeing that downward spiral of sin. They fought the Ammonites, they have a great victory. Instead of celebrating that great victory and rest and peace coming to the land, the, the two tribes begin to fight against each other. People of God begin to fight each other. Is this how it happens? We, we, we take our eyes off the world. We take our eyes off evangeliz- evangelizing the world, of going out and being a witness to Jesus Christ. We take our eyes off that, what we've commanded to do, and what do we do? We look internally, we begin to fight with each other. That's what happens. It's, again, Satan gets right back in there. Oh, the Ammonites, you got a great victory over there, and God's given them in your hands, but let me sow the seeds of discord within the people of God, and here they are murdering each other. Because they can't say a word, because one is jealous, one tribe, Ephraim, is jealous of the other tribe. It leads to the, 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 the killing of upwards to 100,000, almost wipes out the tribe of Ephraim. So how does the story end? Well, the story ends like most of the stories of Judges. We see verse 7, Jephthah judged Israel for six years, and Jephthah the Gideonite died and was buried in the city of Gilead. He, that we see no rest for the land, we see no repentance, we see no revival in the land. We just see a, a nation, we see a people of God that continually go deeper and deeper into sin. We see a hopeless, desperate situation where no one, we're, by the end of Judges, we're going to say no one can straighten out this mess. No one can save these people. No one can deliver these rebellious people. Only one could do that, and his name is Jesus, and he'll, he will come to his people to ultimately deliver that. So, in closing, let's just go back over some of the, we, we, we covered a lot of territory here. A, a couple things, three do's, three don'ts. This is a recap of where we've been. Let's take some of this with us home, hopefully. Number one, do be desperate for God. Do be desperate for God. Grow in your dependence on God, not your independence from God. You are not to live in autonomy from God. You are to live with God and grow in your dependence. Be a dependent Christian on God. Secondly, do grow in your knowledge. Grow in your desperation for God. Grow in your knowledge. Remember we talked about how he knew history. He knew theology. He was able to to talk to the world and be diplomatic. Grow in your knowledge. And and don't just say you're going to grow in your knowledge. Have a plan. Last week was small group Sunday. Did you sign up for a small group? It's a great way to grow in your knowledge. We have all sorts of small groups, all sorts of different ages and couples and college groups and youth groups and, and, and older people's groups and, and, and you name it. We got marriage groups, we got financial, we have all sorts of things to choose from so that you will find a group that you can go to and belong in. Get involved in a small group. Have a plan for personal devotion. If you do not have a plan to grow personally, then you're not growing personally, I guarantee it. You gotta have a plan. What are you reading through? What are you studying through? What's your plan uh, every day to come before God in prayer and study? What's your plan? If you don't have a plan, I would say you're, you're not growing. You need a plan. Grow in your knowledge. Have a plan to do that. And thirdly, do give God the glory. This is God's work, not your work. 
Now get, let me give you three don'ts from today. Number one, and we hit this pretty hard, don't let your past define you. Don't let your past define you. If Jephthah let his past define him, he would have done nothing for God. He would have done nothing for God. You are not what was done to you. You are a child of God. You are not your mistakes. God will use you and call you and empower you and he will set you apart and sanctify you for his use and his glory. That's what he does. Secondly, don't speak foolishly. The Bible, all through the Bible has warnings about what we say and how we speak. Be careful. We see a, a very extreme, sad example of someone speaking harshly and foolishly and it leading to, it could, be, it could have led to, to a, a terrible, sinful thing. And then thirdly, don't act like the world. Don't let the world infiltrate your faith. Do be desperate. Do grow in knowledge. Do give God the glory. Don't let your past define you. Don't speak foolishly. Don't act like the world. And above all, remember this, people. We need Jesus. That's judges. We need a deliverer who can deliver us once for all. We need a redeemer who can redeem us once for all. We need a savior that can save us eternally. Not temporarily. Not, not earthly. Not for a time. We need a savior that can save us once for all, all people for all time, completely. We need Jesus. So don't go to judges and be discouraged. There's a lot to be discouraged about, right? Don't get caught up with that. Be encouraged. Be encouraged, Christian, that your deliverer has come and his name is Jesus and your deliverer will return and he will deliver you once for all. Be encouraged today that Jesus has come, your deliverer has come, you have been delivered. Your Savior has come, your judge has come, your Redeemer has come. So stop seeking temporary deliverance in this world, stop seeking earthly deliverance, stop seeking physical deliverance or material deliverance, and look to Jesus, your deliverer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have delivered us. You've delivered us, delivered us from the realm of Satan and sin. You've delivered us from death. You've delivered us from shame and fear. You've delivered us from our past. You've delivered us from the stupid mistakes we make every single day of our lives. You deliver us again and again. We are, we are hell-bent on running away from you. We're suicidal in our thoughts, Lord. We want to kill our faith. We want to destroy our faith, Lord. We run from you every chance that we get, even as your children that love you, Lord. We are so easily ensnared by sin. We are so easily led astray. We are so easily prone to rebellion in our lives, Lord. Sin is still bound up in us, Lord. We repent of that. We do not want to be like the people of Israel and Judges. We don't want to live in that cycle of sin. We don't want to keep making the same mistake over and over again. We don't want our lives to continue on a downward spiral away from you, Lord. Lord, be merciful to us. Be good to us. Be gracious to us, Lord. Forgive us again. Forgive us our trespasses and our sins, Lord, again. Deliver us again. Be patient with us, Lord. Oh, Lord, you are a patient God, and we fall on your patience. We fall on your grace. That even where our sin abounds, Lord, your grace abounds more. Your grace covers us. You continually delivered your rebellious, wayward children that we are, Lord. Teach us, Lord. Help us to repent. Help us to come to you, Lord. Help us not to, to be foolish. Help us not to live in the past. Help us not to speak wrongly or sinfully, Lord. Help us to be desperate for you, to wake up every single morning and realize there is no way I'm getting through this day without Jesus. Help us to be desperate for you. Help us to give you all the glory that any victory, any blessing, any good thing in our life, we know and acknowledge and praise you, the giver of all good things. Help us to give you all the glory, Lord, and help us to grow in you. The one that we say that we love, the one that we say that we live for, help us to grow in you, to know you more and more every day. Pray that you would do that, Lord, for, for me and my brothers and sisters. I pray for anyone here in this congregation today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that is looking for deliverance in, in all the wrong people and in all the wrong places, looking for the wrong things. 
I pray today they would lift your eyes to you and see you, the true deliverer, the true redeemer, the true rescuer, the true judge, the true savior, the only one that can save us. May today be the day of salvation. May today be the day of someone that can move from death to life, to move from darkness to light, to move from hell to eternity in heaven with you, Lord. I pray that for anyone here that doesn't know you, Lord. We thank you and we love you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.